Thanks, Phil. Um, blockchain leaders, uh, it's myself and Graham, so I'm like the blockchain lead for the bank. Um, I'm a specialist in the technology and the ecosystem. We're trying to understand it and analyze it. It's moving extremely fast. We're trying to figure out what to do with it, how to play. Whether we use the technology, as you say, or whether we use the technology that is one with powerful potential. And I'm going to talk about that. Um, so my background is macro, as, as you pointed out, and macroeconomics. I don't dislike regulation. I like good regulation. It's difficult to change. It's not arbitrary. It spans the globe. All sorts of cool things, which pretty much is encapsulated in this world. It's a really difficult space to understand because it, it combines disciplines from cryptography, really complicated crypto cryptography and mathematics. It combines computer science as well as principles of economics and game theory to keep these networks functioning. So in order to get your head around blockchain and how it works and how cryptocurrency works, you really need to spend a lot of time understanding all of these disciplines and how it's been put together to make these things. Now, I don't want to get into the detail of that because that's where a lot of people, because it takes so much time, you can spend days on this and you don't get anywhere. So I want to talk about this technology as a tool and what's being done with it and what can be done. So that's what I want to talk about. Who... Who's, who here owns cryptocurrency at all? Whose clients own cryptocurrency but not through existing structures? Clients are asking about it. Okay, so I'm not going to give any advice on price. I'm going to I'm gonna give you some illustrations and views on how these clients might be able to access it if we don't put up the structures for them to do it. There's a few things I want to run through. I want to, it looks like it's quite a big agenda. I'm going to go through a couple of these things quite quickly. I'm going to talk about a very brief history of money to sort of set the scene for new forms of money. I want to talk about what the blockchain does to create new forms of money. I then want to get into the discussion of crypto versus blockchain technology. Um, Public-private blockchains, which is kind of the same discussion, and then how you can use these things. I actually want to spend a bit more time on that section. And then to end off with a few thoughts on what I think the future of money might look like. So, first things first. In the information age, we are super connected. We weren't this connected 30 years ago. This is a picture of Facebook's connections around the world from two years ago. You'll notice it doesn't really care about borders. It's the internet, right? We're all connected on devices, through internet protocols, doesn't care about borders, it's seamless, and we're all in the same standards as far as communication. The world of money is kind of different. So we're dealing with very siloed money systems today. And that to me doesn't really make that much sense if we're that connected socially and through commerce. So there's a lot of friction in this, in this system right now. And you're paying transaction fees in order to cross borders which you don't necessarily see, but it adds up in terms of what it means for GDP and all this stuff. So, all the money looks like that. Money has changed a lot in the last 200 years. Okay, so, these little bubbles are just around how the global monetary system has changed in the last 150, 200 years. So, in the 1800s, the world was in a connected money standard. It was called the gold standard. In South Africa, we had 50 private banks, three merchant trading businesses, and one mining house that used to issue private money in this country. Okay. How that worked was Standard Bank, for example, or any of the other banks used to issue banknotes that were a claim on physical gold specie that was kept in the bank's vault. The Reserve Bank was only created in 1921 and so on. So we've had free money before. Competing money. So I was created in 1921. A bunch of stuff happened since then, but basically, um, in 1971, you had the slow evolution you know, um, where the link with real money, gold and silver, was basically cut, and now we tr trade in pieces of paper, which takes us back to this world. So we got very siloed money as well. Bitcoin is obviously created in 2008. 
So two key takeaways. Money wasn't always nationalized. We had private money before. Money systems evolved. As society and society's technology changes. So here's a discussion of what the blockchain is. So if you imagine communicating in a digital age, you think of communicating when you write a letter and you put it in an envelope and you post it to someone. There's a single copy of that thing that travels. Right? If someone intercepts it, it's gone. In the digital age, if you send a WhatsApp from your device to somebody else's, you're duplicating information. You're creating a copy on your device and in somebody else's device. If you're sending in a chat group from your device to 10 other people, you're creating 10 copies of that information. That is not a good characteristic for digital money. So in the information age, in the digital age, we used to have central intermediaries who we entrust with managing money ledgers for us. So what the blockchain does in the context of money is that we all run a copy of this ledger and it ensures that if I send something to you, I don't have ownership of the copy anymore and it's been transferred to you. That's what the blockchain does. It gives us the ability to have money without a central authority in the digital age. So, this is how a payment system works today. So, I mean, if you let's say we're doing commerce online. I'm selling a good, somebody else is buying it. We've got to transact in digital money. I've entrusted my ledger with Investec Bank. You've entrusted your ledger of your accounts with your bank. And you give an instruction to the bank to make a payment, which adjusts your balance. And the adjustment gets made, made on the other side, and typically there's a Visa or MasterCard or some other kind of intermediary like banks or between. <clears throat> That's how money works today. So we basically just hand over the ledgers. These kinds of they're very basic old school ledgers. They haven't really changed. They've just adapted into digital format. That's how banking works. So money couldn't live outside of these silo technology systems. So you basically had to have somebody sitting with a ledger making the changes to the ledger. You couldn't just put the ledger out there and have everybody making changes to it. That's the problem. That was the problem. Blockchain solves that problem. That's what it does. It's designed to create digital skills and to get rid of intermediaries. That's what it does. That's why we can now have digital cash line transactions on the internet with unknown access back. That's what the blockchain does. Um, as a result, we now have for the first time an evolution of money into a privatized, fully digital, borderless money. So this is just a picture of one of the apps on Bitcoin, which is a kind of payments channel, payments network that's been thrown on top of Bitcoin. You can see how the connections don't care about borders at all here. Um, it's internet money. So crypto versus blockchain. So as I've explained to you, blockchain is designed to, to have digital money be scarce without a central intermediary. What a blockchain basically is, it's this ledger. And in a digital sense, it's a printing press for money. So if you say the value is in blockchain technology, not in Bitcoin, for example, or the blockchain technology and not in Ethereum, what you're saying is the value of the dollar or the rand is in the <coughs> printing press. But it isn't. Who knows what the printing press looks like for South Africa? I mean, we've got pictures of the Fed in the, U the US, Fed in America. So what a printing press does is it mints new currency, it creates it. It has specific features to keep it secure and make it difficult not to forge it. And, and if you know what to look for on these pieces of paper, you can verify that it's real dollars or not. That's what a printing press does. That's what a blockchain does. This is a dollar, a US dollar, and this is a dollar too. And it's a Zim dollar. And what's the difference? The Zimbabweans used state-of-the-art German printing technology. Okay. The difference is it's the rules. Who makes the rules for the money? So if you've got a very fancy printing press, but people who are making the rules for your money says, well, we're going to print 100 trillion 
zillion, quadrillion units of it, the value of that money goes down. That's the WhatsApp problem. So it's about the rules. So we've gone from a gold standard where the rules were natural in the money itself, in a metal, physical thing, to a PhD standard. You make the rules today. And that's what I used to analyze. That was my job for um, 12, 13 years. I used to analyze committees of politicians and academic economists who decide on rules for the money. And they all come up with different rules, different things to track. And it's confusing. So you've got an entire industry of economists and analysts analyzing committees, trying to predict what they're going to do with the money down the road. That's, you know, that's what I used to do. It's not that I wasn't good at it, that I kind of got fed up with it, but it's just ridiculous. Like, why are we analyzing these committees? Um, you basically make these decisions behind closed doors. So, I mean, just to, just to just elaborate on this point, the differences in rules. This is a picture of money supply of gold, the Swiss franc, and the US dollar. I've rebased these time series to 1985. So it's all relative, the rate of supply. So you'll see gold very steady. Going back to the early 1900s, the rate of gold supply increase, it fluctuates around 2% per year as the supply increase. It's very difficult to change obvious, for obvious reasons. It's kind of different with the dollar and the Swiss franc. When you bring in the rand, compared to the dollar and the Swiss franc, not a great picture. Rand supply because you target 3 to 6% weakening of your currency every year, it translates to that. You add in the, the Turkish lira, and the rand is still in that picture. Terrible rules, and you can add in Venezuela today. So this is what economists analyze. We're analyzing the different rules in order to try and predict what the supply is going to look like over time, and it's impossible to predict any of that. Some PhDs are better than others. This really complicates cross-border commerce and, and investment, investments and, and loan agreements. And so aren't universal rules that are standardized and enforced by a computer network perhaps way better? And that's all Bitcoin. It's an unchangeable set of money rules. So, just to talk about Bitcoin, there's a, there's a few of these cryptocurrencies all designed to try and solve different problems. But to talk about Bitcoin because it's the brand name, this is the predetermined supply schedule for Bitcoin, up to 21 million units almost in 2140, the year 2140, from 21 through to 2054. That is the supply curve for Bitcoin, and it's not going to change. It can't be changed. It's very difficult. So we can start forming agreements in a money where the rules are set in stone. Maybe that's way better for cross-border agreements and rules matter. It's software and a distributed network of computers. So we could all run a Bitcoin node and go and download the software we have today. We download a copy of the ledger. The rules are in that app, so to speak. And so if somebody goes and downloads a version of the app that changes the code, the rest of us, all of our computers are programmed to kick that person out because they're running wrong code. So the rules are in the computer network, in the software that's downloaded, and, and these computers are connected up. So it's really so you basically have to get everybody to download and update to change the rules. So your rules are going to have to be really good to convince the entire community of users to change the rules. So no government, no committee, no individual, no group of individuals can change the rules without broad consensus. So that's how the rules are set. It's like changing the operating system in your phone, in your computer. It's like you've got to make a conscious decision and effort to change it, and you've got to inspect the rules first. So, so the question is, which standards are you going to trust most? standard, the PhD standard, or the Bitcoin standard. That's what it's about. But it's about more than that, and I'm going to get into that. So public versus private blockchain. So the distinction between these two is, this is the real differentiation we need to make. So 
private blockchain is what the banks typically and regulators are talking about the technology is growing. So what it does is it strips out the cryptocurrency unit from the technology, from this ledger. And it sticks the RAND in there or other existing values to which the rules are still arbitrary, flexible, malleable. And it sticks it back into the paradigm of nation states and jurisdictions and regulations and all this kind of stuff. Instead of public blockchain that have to have a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin or Ether, because that's what keep those, keeps those networks secure, that are open access, anyone can use it, and everybody's welcome, which is where things like Bitcoin come. And that's the, the fundamental difference between these two worlds. So if you say you like blockchain technology, but you like it to be private and exclusive, where you have to sign up and pay account fees in order to use the network, you I mean you're kind of in favor of financial exclusion because everybody can access this and have digital do digital commerce or take a lot to anyone else by not having to go through a bank, even if they're not KYC to do it. Um, so what does it look like? There's kind of different layers of disruption. So private blockchains, like I was saying, it take, takes the cryptocurrency out of the equation. You have rules by committee. You could put it into the existing financial system, but users still have to ask for permission to use that technology. And to be honest, that technology is not, not that much great. In the Whereas on the other side, you've got anyone who can access it. Disrupts both the money and everything on top of the money. Okay, so just to say, who would be disrupted here? JSE, BankServe, Visa, MasterCard, all those sorts of intermediaries between the financial system. And I don't know your guys' industry well enough to be able to give you a sense of what that looks like, but there's going to be people that get eliminated. So, other cool thing about public blockchains, which is a distributed network, like I was describing to you, if you take down one node, the entire network keeps functioning as if nothing happened. So if you try to attack that, it's really hard to do. If you have a centralized network hinging on commercial banks or a central bank, you take down one node, you can take down a whole bunch of them. So that's the difference in the security model, model between these two worlds as well. So this basically spans the entire globe. These networks typically sit within nation states and within specific worlds. So you get a guy like Gideon Gona who goes nuts with a printing press and you get this on dollar that destroys the whole thing. Yeah, that can't happen. So, utility of blockchain. So, this is where it gets cool. Is, um, so, what can you do with this stuff? And what is being built on this stuff? And I'm going to show you some actual examples. Um, so, while I take a sip of water, I'll talk a bit about this. So, this is just a picture of the thing that everybody always talks about is. Is Bitcoin is Bitcoin or Ethereum on new forms of money and they're just going to displace the RAND or they're just going to be, compete with gold or whatever else. There's more to it and I'm going to get to it now. But this is an interesting picture. So from 2010 to today, obviously when Bitcoin launched, the red area in this, in this graph are Bitcoins that transact daily. And if you go out to the dark blue period or shaded area, are Bitcoins that have not transacted for five years or more. So you can see these waves of store of value kind of adoption happening in something like Bitcoin. So either they're storing it because they think it's an alternative for gold and they're going to sell it for rands or dollars down the road. Or they're holding it for that. Plus, there's a new economy of services that are being built that they want to be able to spend this on down. And that's what I want to talk about now. So... Like a, there's a technology stack for this stuff that's being built up. Okay, so Bitcoin, Ethereum, you have this discussion always about the technology down here at the bottom. Complicated, you get bogged down. You've heard about smart contracts, possibly. It's, a, it's an application, so you can deploy software or code, which is an agreement around how money can be transacted between multiple parties on top of, the, on, on top of this blockchain. And it lives in that blockchain. So it's like us coming up with a financial services product. Mm -hmm. um, and we put it into our computer systems at the office. And it gets deployed. You can do this, but on an open internet-based protocol. 
you have decentralized applications like YouTube, Facebook, banking, investment management, all the stuff. I'm going to talk about that. That can get built on here. You can access it through a computing device, on the phone, on the computer, whatever else, via user interfaces. So I'm going to talk to you about a little bit through about you know, a little bit through the ecosystem. So what is a decentralized application or what does it look like? <laughs> Guys in the industry refer to this as DApps, as opposed to apps, DApps, decentralized apps. Okay. Launching a financial services DAP on something like Ethereum is as easy as launching a website on the internet. Okay. A smart contract, which would be something like this, would be code for import loan tools. You can specify all the details of a loan agreement in this contract. I've got a wallet, you've got a wallet, we specify the wallet addresses, we digitally sign a transaction and enter a loan agreement, and this contract gets put on the network and all the computers now know that we've entered an agreement and can validate and verify that that transaction's happened. This is typically how it looks like. Anyone can browse to this and use it. So where we would launch a lending agreement or product within Investec Bank's technology systems, yeah, you're doing it on the internet itself, and anyone in the world can use it. Okay. So I'm going to talk through a few examples. ICOs, crowdfunding, how to create a token. I'll show you a couple of examples of the stuff. Talk about a decentralized exchange. JSC, brokers, market makers, how does it work in this world? What's already functioning out there? I'll talk about stable coins that are created on these platforms without a single integration to the existing financial system. Some asset management stuff, done through smart contracts, legal agreements, social media and blogging, all done on public blockchains. Okay? This stuff's functioning already. So, you would have heard about this cryptocurrency explosion last year, all these new coins coming onto the market that weren't necessarily new competitors to Bitcoin or Ethereum. Most of these was using Ethereum to create new coins which is like listing a coin or a token or an equity on the JSC itself. Okay, so you talk about listing a company on the JSC, you're just putting code in, which specs out how many how many equities are going to be, you know, what the characteristics of those equities are, what they look like. It's the same thing. You can do it on Ethereum, but instead of paying a minimum of 200,000 Rand on for the JSC to do that for you, plus all the other fees associated with it, like annual listing fees, you pay ten dollars to do it on Ethereum. Ten dollars. That's it. Okay, so and it's really easy. So is this gonna play? How is this gonna play? Oh, uh, there's a play button. Okay, so this is how easy it's you can navigate to this website, it talks to the Ethereum blockchain. Click on create token, you can stick in your supply, you can call it what you want to call it, Chris Bucks. You can put in decimal places, so if I want it to be like a RAND, I can put two, if I want it to be like crypto-esque, put in eight decimal places, call it Chris Becker crypto, create token, it'll pop up a message there, which is my Ethereum wallet, I pay a transaction fee of $10. And that coin is created and is deployed in the network, gets deposited into my account, and I can decide how to distribute it from there. That's how easy it is. It takes seconds. That's why we had a massive explosion of ICOs. It's super easy now to create more complicated code around creating an ERC20 token. So you can now start crowdfunding with all sorts of rules around who can lend to you, invest in you, what, what the agreement looks like, what you have to deliver, where the token can be used, where you can trade, all this kind of stuff. You can just browse to this website and do it. It'll walk you through a couple of steps. And your crowd sale is done. Um, and for this reason, oh, there's the mouse. I just want to show you this because it's quite cool. How did you do this? Just trying to... There's the mouse. Mouse disappeared. So, and um, this is a timeline of these ICOs, these new tokens that have been created over time. Going back to 2014, 
the ecosystem was, you have to be technically very competent and savvy to be able to invest in Ethereum back in the day. It was really hard to do. You had to run a full node and you couldn't do it on your device or any of this stuff. Anyway, Ethereum raised $19 million. The ecosystem wasn't ready up until about early January, maybe even mid-2017, where suddenly guys had built the software where if an ICO happened, you can invest in it, and a coin will automatically be deposited on your phone. That's what happened. This is one application of, of Ethereum's public blockchain. All of these transactions, all these listings, have to pay those fees. Of $10, very basic contract, $10, more complicated stuff could be more. But in order to do stuff on this network, you have to pay in Ether, which is the cryptocurrency for the Ethereum economy, basically. So like you want to come list on the JSC here, yeah, you want to pay in RAND, RAND's on accepted here. And so it starts to give you a sense of the transactional value of these currencies and what you can do with it. So this was one application of Ethereum, that drove the manual last year, is way more you can do with this, which we'll get into now. So when people typically talk about cryptocurrencies, we're talking about all this stuff, the whole ecosystem, and there's actually a lot of nuance. And we've tried to, as much as possible, bucket this into a taxonomy of crypto assets. So, I would say pure cryptocurrencies, you can break it up into payment crypto and platform crypto. Payment crypto is designed to be just a currency. Single application, money. Bitcoin, Litecoin, Monero. That's what it's designed to do. I've just explained to you how Ether is a platform crypto because you use that currency to pay the platform to do other stuff, like list new tokens. So you got a bunch of cryptos there. Now, those platforms where you create these tokens gets broken up into protocol tokens, which is application tokens. I'm going to talk a bit about how these application tokens are like coin-operated rides. So coin-operated rides for kids, you drop in a specific coin and the thing starts going. You can now build apps that work on the same model, but you can only use that coin to use that app, that app. And it changes the entire business model of Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, all these guys that consume the data. So I'm going to talk about that just now. Securities tokens is where the regulators are moving in on because they understand the space. And it's within the existing regulatory world. This is where most of the regulation is focused. And side chains, kind of complicated, but it's another way of creating coins on top of Bitcoin. So, complicated. Anyway. So once we've got all these tokens, what can we do with them and how do we trade them? So firstly, you can, I can send any of these tokens to anyone here who has the right wallet. Peer-to-peer -peer without an intermediary, it's processed by the platform, you can do that. But what if I want to trade that token with somebody else who I don't know, who sits in Singapore? Or anywhere, and I've never seen the guy's name, I don't know who it is. Well, you can navigate to a user interface like this. It's called etherdelta.com, the website. It's a decentralized token exchange where the transaction is intermediated not by brokers, custodians, central securities, depositories, and all this stuff, but purely by a smart contract on the Ethereum network. So you can then go and click on the drop down up there with MKR. There's a list of a lot of these tokens. I can find, you know, I can go into the order book, I can find the sellers and the buyers, and I can do my transaction. Pay a small transaction fee. My order gets loaded up into the Ethereum network, and once it matches, I can just get coins. That's how easy it is. It doesn't integrate with an existing bit of the existing financial infrastructure, which looks like that. You know, you've got your seller and your buyer, you've got custodians, brokers, clearinghouses, market makers, exchange, CSD, and the whole thing. It just gets collapsed into Ethereum. All you're going to see is a website. That's what you deal with. And so you've got a single technology system where regulators, auditors, tax authorities can all get a seat at the table because it's fully transparent. If I do a transaction and they know who I am, it's all on there. They can just get it. They don't have to go and ask brokers or anyone else to get access to their technology systems to see what's happened. So not even the regulators have to ask for permission to see what's going on. Another really cool application is a lot of guys say, you know, Ethereum, Bitcoin, and these things are too volatile, they're never going to become money. Well, you can deposit your Ether, which is volatile, into a smart contract governed by MakerDAO, which is just a gap, a 
an ecosystem. You can deposit Ether in there. That becomes collateral to create new cryptocurrency against it. So the smart contract has collateral rules around how many new tokens can get created. It's got margining rules that are programmed into the smart contract. And it's got a process in order to keep the value of that new coin stable at one to one against the dollar. So this thing launched, this is the price of Ethereum. Okay, Ethereum obviously has crashed quite a lot since December. It's down like 50, 60, 70% worth. DAI launched in December and it's been pretty good around keeping its value against the dollar. So this is pegged against the dollar. It's been created to reference the dollar without a single integration to the dollar financial system. And you can use this as money. You can do loan agreements in this. You can send this around. You can pay in it. But no one has to hold dollars in a trust account. It's back. The decentralized crypto asset management platform, Melon, um, also it's intermediating the entire process through smart contracts on the platform. I just added this in yesterday because I thought it would be relevant for you guys, but I actually don't. I haven't looked too much into how this might work. I will do so soon. It's got a governance platform where you need to own its tokens called the ML and Melon token, MLM. If you own that token, you get voting rights around governance. So it's changing the way that distributed decentralized businesses on the internet will get managed and governed, basically. So anyway. Smart contract cuts out a lot of the administration, record keeping and auditing and risk management, all the stuff gets stuck, stuck into a smart contract. Here's another cool project. Open law is what they're doing here is creating the ability to enter dynamic digital legally binding agreements on the Ethereum blockchain. To enter those agreements on the Ethereum blockchain. So this is still in beta phase. But, I mean, essentially what you're dealing with is a platform where people can log on. There would be a list of different kinds of agreements and templates. There are fields where you can make changes here. You can make other markups in the body of the agreement. And once you've made your changes, you can send it to other people. And you then sign it with your digital signature on the Ethereum blockchain which creates like a verifiable trust that it was you who made the changes to this contract. And so everybody who's in the process of forming a legal agreement can now in a distributed way verify who's signed what and made what changes. And once we all agree to a contract and agreement, we all sign that agreement. Our digital signatures, like our fingerprints, we basically get stamped on this thing. And no one can then go back on their words. So this will have to start integrating with the existing processes. With courts, with legals, you know, the legal fraternity, all this kind of stuff. But a lot of what the legal fraternity does is going to get automated. Not so much paper pushing, that's going to happen. So social media stuff. This is called Steemit. Steemit is basically just a blogging and social networking site. So anyone can go and register. It's powered by a cryptocurrency as well, called Steemit. So if I go and create content, I've actually got an account and I haven't done much, but um, you can create a post, you stick it on here, you get clicked on, you get upvoted, you get likes. It doesn't cost you anything to like someone else's work. But depending on your sort of weight, your steam power as they call it, you have more say over the quality of stuff. You know, so this guy's gotten a lot of votes. He's earned $555 out of the steam, the steam cryptocurrency. So this blockchain is designed to reward users for producing good content in newly created crypto called Steam. And so as a result, you see YouTube and Facebook content producers moving onto these platforms because they cannot directly monetize their content. You don't have to rely on Facebook or Google's algos to push ads of your users that they click on. You can actually produce content where if it gets live, you're earning that crypto, which interestingly has gone up 1,500% in the last year. So, I mean, why not take a putt? You know? So, I think the price behavior around these things is a big part of like speculative kind of behavior and moving onto these platforms, which helps to bootstrap network effects. 
Anyway, so you can now see as those people have moved across, they've earned this crypto, they've got content there, they're incentivized to also make this platform work, which draws new people in, and that's how I think people can start to shift. It's, it's quite interesting because you've got this whole hashtag lead Facebook thing that's also trending. People have realized that it's not free to put your information on. It's got all sorts of consequences. That can't happen now. You control your information. Crypto Cribs is Airbnb on the blockchain on Ethereum. It's already live. You can go and rent places in Cape Town using a site. It's pretty cool. Like It's quite slick. You type in your destination, check in, check out. Um, you can access it through the website. So basically, it's intermediated by a smart contract as well. So you cut out the Airbnb intermediary. You can access it through a website, through your phone. Um, this is what Airbnb looks like today in terms of the financial web. A lot of people involved. Obviously, it gets even more complicated. That's what Ethereum and crypto proof looks like. All on a single technology system, governed by a smart contract, cuts out the 35% intermediary fee. The value accrues to the users. But you've got to pay in Ether to use this. Now, you can use a, you, you can either use Ether or that stable coin that I spoke about, which is linked to the dollar. So, all sorts of interesting stuff. Um, there's a lot of dApps. There's 1,300 of them just on this website. They kind of curate these dApps. There's 1,300. I'll show you a few interesting ones. Um, what's super powerful about this is uh, we can build an app starting tomorrow, that references code out of any of these 1,300 dApps registered here. So because all this code is just software on the Ethereum blockchain, we can build a financial product that leverages everything and give it to users through a single interface, for example. So anyway, the utility of crypto, the technology, firstly is So, Internet Simplified and Expanded Communications, what public blockchain does is it opens up and gives people all around the world the ability to form agreements on the internet, financial agreements. It's the transactional layer for the next generation of the internet. That's what it's about. So, we know WebT.O, we're all familiar with all of these apps. These guys have siloed technology systems and they monetize all our information. Web3.0 runs on public blockchain protocols that have cryptocurrencies that keep them secure and openly accessible to anybody in the world to build new dApps where we can monetize our own information and content. That is what this is about. It's Web3.0. It's all complicated under the hood, like the internet is. We don't know how email works, most of us in this room, I'm sure. You're not quite sure what the difference between HTTP and HTTPS is, or what SMTP is, that's what your email runs on. Um, or we don't know, but it's super simple for users. You can download, you can browse to these places, all you need is an Ethereum wallet, and you can start transacting. So a lot of people get lost in the discussion around Bitcoin and Ethereum and how it works. This is, this is where the adoption is taking place. Quite easy to use now. So a couple of thoughts in the future. How much time have I got? Come on. A couple of minutes. Okay. So um, is this kind of different to the narrative you've heard before around crypto? Does it make more sense now? It's not. <laughs> you confused It takes a while to take it in. It's the internet with its own money now. Only way to form agreements. It's like trying to explain, I'm trying to tell my wife, because I'm reading this book. So it's, try, it's like trying to explain the internet to somebody and how it will, how you use it in your life, from watching TV, streaming, that kind of stuff. Try and explain that to somebody in 1985. Yeah. And it's very hard to explain, but it's not going away. There's such a great video clips on YouTube of Steve Jobs and Bill Gates talking about the future of personal computing from the early age. And so Steve Jobs used to get up in 1981-82, and he'd say, so, who in this room owns a personal computer? Ah, oh, oh, maybe 10%. Of and then he'd go into this whole thing about personal computing, and people would be like, oh, 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 oh. 
I don't know, I don't get it. But it just, it just, it just happened. And this is why it's going to just happen. Okay? Millennials are the light. How does cryptocurrency relate to our existing land? Does it? We can't hear the question as well. How does cryptocurrency relate to our existing land? It doesn't at all. It's a completely new form of money. So, but if I want to buy a Bitcoin, I've got to pay X amount of rent. Oh, yeah. So, so then you've got to go to a marketplace, like an exchange. Like if you would go and buy equities, you've got to sell some rent to buy some equities from someone. You can go to Luno, which is a Bitcoin exchange in South Africa. You sign up, you register with them, you deposit rent into your account there, which is still held with a bank, or a standard bank, and if and B, I think it's banking relationships. Um, and then from there, you can sell the rent to get some Bitcoin. Once you've got that, it opens up this world. You can't enter this world without it. So it's almost like it's this, this parallel alternative financial industry that's been born here. Which is pretty exciting. But millennials, so this is where adoption happens with millennials. I mean, millennials are the largest generation in the US, in the history of the world. It's the last, largest generation in the history of the world. In the US, we have 90 million millennials, which is way larger than. Gen X, baby boomers, any of the former generations, um, and they're just starting to enter their prime income years now. Um, what's interesting about them is just how they respond to different surveys about the future of money and banking. 84% of millennials in this Gen Y millennials same thing, in a KPMG survey, found that they would consider banking with a tech job, with a technology giant. It's quite a lot. Eighty percent of those respondents in the same survey said they place a really high priority, extremely important or very important, is cross-border transactions and universal acceptance. Eighty percent. This is a study done by Facebook out of their users in the U.S. They found that 45, half, basically half of millennials are either very open to switching banks, brokerages, credit cards. Half of them, half of them feel. But their bank doesn't understand them, and only eight percent of them trust financial institutions for guidance. They crowd. They started. They crowd. They actually. They find that, that millennials crowdsource financial advice. Thirty percent of millennials would rather have a thousand dollars in Bitcoin than government bonds. Thirty percent. And 27 percent of them would rather have a thousand dollars of Bitcoin over equity. 48% of millennials think that this is a positive innovation for finance. And 42% reckon most people will be using Bitcoin in the next 10 years. And that's interesting because it's happening at a time when trust in government in the US is at the lowest levels ever. And if you don't trust your government, you trust its money. So the ECB put this tweet out on Twitter. They got 25 20, well, 29,500 people responded to it. Their question was, does Bitcoin, could it offer a viable alternative to, to, to traditional currencies? 75%? Yes. So, that's the technology. It's what's being built on top of these protocols. Technology adoption rates in the last 150 or so years have been accelerating. So, it took a long time for the telephone and electricity and all these things to be to reach 100% adoption amongst US households. Other things have taken far quicker. Bitcoin is down here. Probably hasn't gone past this far. This is back to 2005. So if we fast forward now, that's where Bitcoin is. It's like there. It's less than 1% adoption right now. There's at most 40 million Bitcoin wallets in the world. There's 30 million Ethereum wallets. And because we mess around in the space, we have three or four wallets each. So there's probably I'd say most 10 million people that own Ethereum at all. So adoption in terms of US is low. Worldwide, it's even lower. We're down here. Okay. So I've studied technological revolutions and adoption cycles. Typically, major disruptions, major disruptive technologies take around half a century to diffuse through society. Those are things like you know, mechanized production, steam engine, um, the internet. The internet started in 1970, not for people. 
50. I think blockchain is going to take 50 years. We're 10 years into this, and we're still a pretty low adoption rate. I'd say we're somewhere in phase one right now. So this, this study by Carlota Perez specifically looks into technological revolutions. Um, uh, yeah, it looks at like financial capital and how it gets involved. It talks a lot about financial capital. There's, who knows of an institution, an institutional manager in South Africa that it has any money in space? There isn't one. Not a single one. We haven't even entered the frenzy pack phase of this, which is where financial capital starts to understand a technology and comes in big time. We're not there yet. Those solutions still have to get built. And that's partly the problem. And the, the same problem we had with ICOs, where you couldn't do ICOs pretty sort of mid last year, you can't as an institution get access to crypto assets because there's no way to store it safe. Where you meet your fiduciary duties. This stuff's all getting built still. We're still in this installation period. What typically happens is you have a massive crash after this thing gets like 50% adopted, major crisis, regulators come in, the paradigm is set, we now understand how this technology works, we get our heads around the landscape and the ecosystem, and now we can form some regulation. It typically happens around the mid, mid of the adoption and that sort of diffusion cycle. I think we're another 10 to 15 years away from it. Everybody's still talking about cryptocurrency, there's a world of dApps, legal agreements, all sorts of stuff that no one even started talking about. So, I don't even think about the price of Bitcoin or Ethereum. I think about adoption. So the thing is, we're on an adoption curve here, and it's going to be parabolic. It's, I think it's going to be like this. But the supply of these currencies are fixed. And so a lot of the people who are starting to understand the technology are hodling, as it's called in the industry, you buy and hold, you're waiting for the adoption to get 50% or more, which would coincide with an ecosystem where you can actually use that currency in that economy itself. Most people, I would say, are not looking to come back into rands of dollars. They want to spend it on Web3. That's, that's what I think is going to happen. So, prior generational cycles, this is the last point, basically. KYG. Just a joke. Uh, Economics there. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Silent generation bought gold. Baby boomers bought equities. Gen X bought hedge funds. Millennials aren't buying any of that stuff. They're buying crypto. They're investing into a new financial system. Now, so I think those are my thoughts. That's the end. I think. Um, no, thanks.